bonny boat, like a bird on the wing, onward the sailors cry. Carry the lad that's born to be king. Good evening and welcome to Inverness Outlanders. We're broadcasting from the vaults in the depths of McGregor's Bar, which is right in the heart of the ancient part of Inverness. It's uh, the old town of Inverness. Here we are in a building that dates back to probably just after the Jacobite Rebellion. And it's the day after the winter solstice. So what better time to be looking at standing stones and pagan rituals and all that kind of things. Uh, this is a programme that has been inspired by the Outlander book and the, the TV series, but it's much more than that because we're looking at the inspiration for those books and the, the TV series. We're going to be looking at the land, the language, the people and the culture of the Highlands. Yeah, hello the house and here at Inverness Outlanders Live we're going to be delving into the history of Inverness and the Highlands, the iconic setting for the early part of Diana's Outlander series. We're going to be chatting to people who know about the Highlands inside and out, and we're going to be giving you an insight into the history of Inverness, its past, its present and beyond. But most importantly of all, we want to engage with all of you out there around the world. We'd love to know if you've any questions for us. Um, do you have any stories you want to share? Um, are there any subjects you'd like us to talk about in future shows? It's a live show, it's also an interactive show. show. And in order for you to communicate with us, Bruce has got all the details. Yeah, and because it's live, that means anything could go wrong at any stage. So do not be surprised if we disappear or things go wrong. Stick with us. And if you want to get in touch, please get in touch by email. It's hello the house at yahoo.com. Any pictures you have, any stories you have, any questions you have, please send them. Uh, we'd love to get in touch with you all across the world. Also, if you do have the chance, if you're watching on Facebook, if you can do the, the party share, there's a little icon down, I think it's to the left, you can press that and it'll be able to share it to all your friends. Anybody you think might be interested in Inverness, the Highlanders, the Highlands and uh, Outlander, please get in touch with them, let them know that this programme is on. Yes, you'll see that our, we've chosen to call our um, email address Hello the House, and that's how I greeted you all this evening. Now, that is actually a traditional greeting, probably southern United States in origin, and it was given as a greeting when you approached a household to let them know that you were actually a friendly visitor. Diana reuses the phrase in her eighth book, Written in My Own Heart's Blood, and it's also, you'll see it used by Atlander groups um, on Facebook posts and announcements, just as I did this evening. Yeah, I've got a feeling I'm going to be learning an awful lot uh, in the next few months. I'm Bruce McGregor, and uh, I'm a presenter on BBC Radio Scotland, the travelling folk programme. And I'm also a professional fiddle player with the band Blazing Fiddles. We've been uh, touring the world now for about 20 years. So I've been lucky enough to have been brought up with the music, the myths and the legends of the Highlands. And I'm Caroline Keith. I'm a Highlander and I was born in Inverness, grew up in Fort William and spent many happy caravan holidays touring the Highlands, which is where I got my love for the country. So no surprise that I am a tour guide these days, although not exactly this year, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm a big Outlander fan and I'm also a member of Inverness Outlanders. And just to give you um, a heads up in case you're not familiar with the Inverness Outlanders, we're actually a small group of Outlander fans based in and around Inverness. We meet up regularly, about once a month. These days, it's just a Zoom chat that we have. But we share and chat about all things Outlander. And we also like to share our information and our thoughts with Outlander fans worldwide, hence Inverness Outlanders Live. And on the other side of tonight's camera is another Inverness Outlander member, that is Jo De Silva. Now she's also a big Outlander fan, and just to put you completely in the picture, she's also Bruce's wife. Yeah, I had to get the job some way, didn't I? 
That was, <laughs> that was it. Nepotism is alive and rife in the Highlands. Uh, Inverness is quite an amazing place. Uh, anybody who knows anything about the history here will tell you about the Loch Ness Monster. But there's so, so much more than that. We can take you from King Brood uh, standing there and meeting St Columba, the birth of Christianity in the Highlands, and the first sighting of the Loch Ness Monster in 565 AD. We can take you to the castle, which has housed Macbeth, Mary Queen of Scots. And we also, just looking across the water there to the north of us, we have the home and eventually, um, unfortunately, uh, the, the end place for the Brand Seer, Scotland's Nostradamus, a man who predicted all sorts of amazing things. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't predict how he was going to end up in a rather sticky mess at the end of his life, but we will probably come on to him later on. We also have so much history that we want to share with you uh, about the clans and about our language and things here. And our show is going to try and bring you a flavour of uh, that history. And Caroline, uh, just now, is going to take you way, way back into the mists of time. <laughs> A rather chilly December morning in the Highlands of Scotland, and welcome to Clava Cairns. We're just outside Inverness, and in fact, we're not very far at all from Culloden Battlefield. Clava Cairns is an ancient cemetery, which we'll be talking about later on. It's 4,000 years old, and it's one of Scotland's most evocative prehistoric monuments. It's also one of the many tourist attractions that seen a significant increase in visitor numbers over the past few years, thanks to Outlander, this past pandemic year aside, of course. And the reason for the increased visitors coming to Clava Cairns is because it's the closest that we have in Inverness to Diana's fictional Craig Nadoon stones. The site is actually three cairns. A cairn is a mound of stones erected as a memorial and each of the cairns here is surrounded by a circle of standing stones. And how lucky are we that of the standing stones here, one of the megaliths is really similar to the stone that Claire time travelled through in the Outlander TV series. And here, as you'll see from the stone behind me, a split rock, a split stone, very similar to the one that Diana describes Claire time travelling through in the Outlander book. And of course, we're justifiably proud of the fact that Clava Cairns is right here on our doorstep and we can visit it, sorry guys, anytime we want. But um, we can't lay claim to the fact that it was the inspiration behind Diana's Outlander stones. Now I've heard many fans and even tour guides stating this is the, the fact, but really Diana's significant research um, of generic stone circles in Scotland was what gave her the inspiration. In fact, she only came to Clava Cairns and in fact Scotland for the very first time after she'd written Outlander. But the most important aspect of Clava Cairns, and in fact the majority of Bronze Age monuments around Britain, is the fact that the Cairns are aligned to the rising and setting sun at different times of the year. The most important, or one of the most important, being the setting sun of the winter solstice. And during our programme tonight, we're going to be taking a look at the people who built Clava Cairns, why they built it, who they built it for and why the winter solstice was so important to them. So we hope you'll stick around to hear a little bit more. We are so lucky to have that on our doorstep. It's funny as well, I grew up not really knowing much about it. You know, it was just on our doorstep. We mm -hmm. drove past it and nobody, I don't think anybody in Scotland took much notice of it. It was just on the side of the road. And it's now become a really important uh, part of our, our history and heritage. We have had so many of you getting in touch as well. Susan Hurst from Oklahoma, Wendy Luther uh, from Massachusetts, Kendall Casey Snyder in Alabama, uh, Mary's, Mary's Menders um, saying hello. And uh, Darlene Kelly is asking what the weather is like 
it's cold. That's a bit, it's not bad though. It Three was, degrees. Yeah, it was absolutely beautiful this morning, but it has turned uh, rather yeah. cold. No snow yet though. No snow yet. Who's, who else has been there? I have a few shout outs from somebody called Barry Waldo. <laughs> Hi, Barry. <Yeah. laughs> um, a few other people. We've got um, Lily Rehack in Florida. Sorry for my pronunciations. Um, Debbie Jo in Glasgow. Anne Daly, Glenn Moyer in Keithsville, Louisiana. I'm going to do a shout out because I've got the floor to the Spirit of Outlander Tours. Hello, everybody who I've guided over the past few years. Sorry we didn't get to meet up this year, but hopefully next year. And also a shout out from one of our members, Mary, to the Outlander North Carolina group. We've also got Barbara Henderson from New Zealand, Cheryl Going from Miami, Carol Mala from California, Diane Thomas from Texas, and Daniela Stadler from Germany. Uh -huh. And I've got to say hello to the Outlander podcast and Outlandish UK. That's absolutely fantastic. Can really, it? thank you so much for joining us. And please do remember, if you can share it with other people, we'll try and build the community as we try and build the, the program up as well. Uh, where is our next up? Because because we have got so much to try and squeeze in, we're going to move quite quickly. Where are we off to next? We are off to Cotton House Hotel, Bruce. Now, a lot of people watching will be very familiar right. with that. Just to set it in context, uh, Culloden House was owned by the Hanoverian supporting Forbes family. And then in 1746, the Jacobites requisitioned it and used it as their headquarters in the build-up to Culloden. And in actual fact, Bonnie Prince Charlie stayed there for a few days prior to the battle itself. Now, unfortunately, the house suffered greatly in a fire and decayed quite a lot and was eventually replaced by another house. So Culloden House Hotel is only about 200 years old. And there is, however, the vaults in the basement are the original ones from the, the, the first house. And also there is a small piece of a wall still remaining from the original house, which the staff at the hotel would be more than happy to let you know about if you, if you ask them. Also, um, Diana is known to visit Corden House Hotel quite a lot when she, when she visits Inverness. And there is a seat in the walled garden of the grounds dedicated to her, thanks to the ladies of Lallybrock, the first Outlander fan group. And also, it's somewhere that the Inverness Outlanders like to go for afternoon tea on occasion. Very and civilized. in actual fact, we were there um, a year ago and should have been there on Sunday for our annual Christmas get together. Aww. But COVID managed to scupper that. That's a shame. It's such a beautiful place and really, really friendly staff there. We actually took a staycation, Mrs. McGregor and myself and uh, Josh. We headed there for one night. Uh, that was our holiday this year. One night, three miles away across town to get to it. Uh, and I was kind of inspired. I was really, really lucky when I was younger to be taught music out of this book. It looks like it might have come from the, the 18th century, but it's just been well used. These are the airs and melodies peculiar to the Highlands of Scotland and the Isles, communicated in an original, pleasing and familiar style um, for the piano, forte, harp, organ or violin, cello, uh, uniquely acquired during the interesting period between 1715 and 1745 through the authentic source narrated in the accompanying prospectus. What a title. <laughs> How would you file that? We actually just call it the Captain's Collection. It was loads of tunes that were collected by Captain Simon Fraser, who actually ended up his days living right across from our pub in Rose Street over there. He published this book in 1815, uh, and it was all tunes that were about the Jacobites, uh, and most of them were actually songs, but Captain Simon Fraser, being a little bit of a crawler and trying to get in with the Hanoverians in 1815, stripped the tunes of all their lyrics. Uh, all those Jacobite lyrics were kind of thrown into the bin, which is a great shame, but at least he kept the melodies. And this is a melody from the book. Uh, I'll let you hear it first. This was filmed when we went to Culloden House. Uh, this is a tune called Hard Is My Fate.
So that is the tune uh, from this book, the Captain Simon Fraser um, collection. And when I was younger, I was told that the story behind that was that after the Battle of Culloden, Bonnie Prince Charlie fled and uh, there was a bounty on his head. £30,000 was uh, the bounty. And he was taken in by one of his supporters and hidden way up in a, in a small cupboard. And uh, during the night, whilst hiding there, he heard chatter outside and he was absolutely convinced that he was going to be sold out. So he burst through the door to confront who he thought those had um, sold him out. And he found it was just the, the children of the house who were so excited to have the king hiding in, you know, in this little loft space. And he seemingly said, hard is my fate that the idle chatter of children has put such fear in me. So uh, that is uh, a book we will be visiting quite a bit. We've got a lot of musicians and singers that we will be joining uh, over the, the coming months um, who have been involved in the series and also have a great insight to the music from this area. So I think we've got Gilly Bridge McMillan and uh, Siobhan Miller for two. And uh, we are looking for your connections with the programme. If perhaps, I don't know, maybe you met the main man or something like that, Carolyn. <laughs> Uh, am I allowed to speak now? Uh, you, you go for that, you go for that. <laughs> now, I'm going to have to check with the producer if I'm allowed to give the full dramatic, no holds barred story. Um, we live in Scotland and for that we're, we're very grateful, but it does mean that from time to time, people like Sam Hume, Graham, Graham McTavish do come our way. Now, last year when Graham and Sam were filming their Men in Kilts TV series, they popped into Culloden Battlefield and several of our members were very lucky to be in the right place at the right time and got photographs and a meet and a greet. But one of our members, uh, the lovely Katrina McIntosh, was actually the guide that had the good fortune to, to take them around the battlefield. So will actually appear in the TV series and is mentioned in the Clan Lands book. Now, this year, on the 3rd of September, 2020, I was due to meet another Inverness Outlander friend, Mary, in a, a small deli in Bewley, just outside of Inverness, for lunch. And I got there first, and as I was waiting, I could see Mary hurriedly coming over to the, the restaurant, looking very excited because she'd only seen Graham McTavish cross the road and go into the Love at Arms Hotel. Well... <laughs> Who do you think went into the Love at Arms Hotel next? That was us to find out exactly what was going on. Now, just an aside, the Love at Arms Hotel, um, for anyone who's ever going to be going to Inverness and visiting Bewley, is owned and run by um, one of the clan, Fraser and Fraser. And it's bedecked from uh, carpet to ceiling with clan Fraser memorabilia and tartan. Anyway, so Mary and I headed into the Love at Arms Hotel only to find that, yes, the cast and crew of Men in Kilts had indeed been there for lunch, but had now departed. We were devastated, so we ran out into the street, had a good look around, saw nobody we recognised, but picked on a couple of members of the crew and asked if they knew where Sam. Picked on, I like that phrase, we picked on them. Yes. Oh, too cold of them. And asked where Sam and Graham was. One of them pointed to my right at a car which she said was Sam's car, and I could actually make out in the passenger seat a sam light figure, but getting into the driver's seat and switching on the ignition was the driver. And it was at this point, it was like a slow motion. I ran towards the car saying, stop! <laughs> and I ran up to the passenger seat, which was wound down, and I came face to face with Sam. <laughs> and I think I asked very politely if he wouldn't mind getting out of the car for a photograph with me and Mary before he left for his afternoon shoot. He did. I must have been very polite or desperate. I'm not quite <laughs> sure. But he, he, was, he was so gentlemanly. Um, we got our pictures taken with him. And at that point, I then thought he would just get back in the car and head off for his shoot. No, he stood there. At which point I thought, I have to talk to Sam Hewitt. And... I can give this as a piece of advice to anybody else who may ever meet um, Sam Hewen, Graham McTavish, or anybody that you're a fan of. Have a question ready. Because <laughs> the only thing I could think of to talk to him about was the weather. 
honest to goodness, I'm so embarrassed. As an ex-PR and a tour guide, you'd think that I'd come up with something better than the weather. But it broke the ice, and Sam chatted with myself and Mary for a wee while. No idea how long it was. I was just going between, I was eye level with his pecs, and going from his pecs to his eyes. So I was just in, in, a, in a state of happiness. Anyway, he did eventually have to leave and go on with the afternoon shoot. And just as Mary and I were walking away, lo and behold, who should be crossing the road towards us was Graeme McTavish. So we got a double whammy. We got a picture with Graeme as well. And we were delighted. Yeah, they just seem, everything I've read about them, they just seemed like genuinely nice, nice people. You know, yeah. that trip around Scotland, everybody who bumped into them and met them just said, absolutely fantastic, which is great because... Well, not all superstars are like that. No. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely not. Now, our producer, Mrs McGregor, was very, very lucky and very excited um, when we were down at an award ceremony down in Edinburgh or Glasgow. I can't quite remember. I met Miss Scotland. I was quite excited about that. Miss Scotland was one of the, the people handing out the prizes and uh, Kevin Bridges. But uh, Mrs McGregor was very excited to meet Diana, Diana uh, Galdon. And there she is, looking, smiling away. That was a, a great night altogether. Um, so we're asking you out there, if you've met any of the crew, the cast, anything like that, send in some photographs to us. We'll be able to put them up here. We'll be able to populate the programme with your stuff rather than us talking, which is always an awful lot better, actually, I think, and a lot easier mm -hmm. for us as well. So if you can, remember the email address is hello at the house at yahoo.com. So we're looking for anybody, any brushes you've had with the programme. I, for instance, this is the only brush I've had with it, one of my bandmates, Rudy McMillan, um, one of the most, her sweet gentleman I've ever met, has just got a, one of the most fantastic beards, um, huge, fulsome beard. And he was one of the fiddlers. He was in one of the early parts of the, the series. And he was quite excited about it all. And then they had one look at him and said, oh, no, no, you'll need to get rid of that beard, which I can't quite understand because there's a lot of beards all in that program. But he had to shave off the whole beard. And then he watched the film back. And you'll see the back of his head. So he lost it all for absolutely nothing. So that was poor Rudy. Um, but if you do have the chance, please do send them. It's hello at the house at yahoo.com. So we've touched upon the group, mm -hmm. um, but I think we're going to do a little bit more. Well, yes, um, we, we thought you might like to know just a little bit more about who Inverness Outlanders actually are and what we do. So we sent Bruce along to have a wee chat with Sinead, one of the founding members. Well, in actual fact, they were just sitting in the other corner of the studio over there. Just downstairs from the pub, so it wasn't that hard. <laughs> <laughs> so we are joined by Sinead from the Inverness Outlanders to find out, well, just everything about them to begin with. So tell us, when did the group get together and what was the, the inspiration? Well, um, I've been an Outlander fan for years. Um, I read the books years ago and Outlander was always there in my heart, but I didn't know any other people who were as crazy about Outlander as I was. So back in 2013, um, in June 2013, Stars announced that there was going to be a show, that they were going to make a show called Outlander. So all the fans got really excited about it and we all started to buzz about on, online and discovered there was other fans um, out there. So in, that was June, in July, Sam Hugan was announced as Jamie Fraser. So we eventually had our Jamie that we had read about for years and years. We had no idea what he was going to be like. And suddenly we had Sam as our Jamie. So we were very excited as fans. So that's your spark. So that was a big spark. And that brought so many fans onto Twitter. Because um, Jay at the time, Sam was only on Twitter, so brought so many fans onto Twitter at the time, so we all start tweeting together. Sam was very responsive because there were so few fans out there at the time, so we were all, um, everyone was very excited. But then also to discover that there's lots more fans out there from Inverness and from Scotland, so it was lovely to then find other fans out there. Yeah. Um, Stars put out a, um, a poll to say who, what would, what do Outlander fans want to become? Because at the time, Sam, um, Sam's fans became hooligans, and they said, "Well, what's an Outlander fan called?" So they put out a poll, and um, the fans decided they just wanted to be called Outlanders. 
So, and then it was natural then that we would be called the Inverness Outlanders. So we became the Inverness Outlanders. Yeah. And you've got a real head start. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. Inverness Outlanders, it's right here. the heart of the, the story. Really. Yeah, the book starts in Inverness. We're in Inverness, so we do have a head start. Yeah. So. And did you have a, a kind of goal or has it evolved over the years of what you wanted to do? Um, it's kind of grown. We, at first, we just wanted to meet other people who were as mad about um, Outlander as we were. So we became a small group that and we met together and we, we'd talk about what was happening online or what the next thing was. So it was just really nice to meet other people who were as passionate about um, the Diana's books as we were. So at first we wanted to do that, but then we discovered that there were lots of other fans out there that wanted to... Um, they wanted to discover more about Inverness and we knew because we live here we knew a lot more about Inverness than fans. A lot of fans came along and they said well besides Clavacairns and Culloden what else is there to visit um, in Inverness so we knew lots of other places that were outlander connected that people might have associated like small places that were connected with the books so we created a blog at the time to get out there so that other fans um, knew what else was around Inverness. Yes, yeah, so it's a, a really worthwhile endeavour and I mean, you've done quite a lot of other things as well. Yeah, the map is one thing. Yeah, so it? the blog, we got lots of interest um, and we went to the Highland Games and we created a blog into kind of um, like when you, like a school project basically. Of course we had lots of B&Bs coming to us saying like they'd never heard about Orlando. We said, oh, where do you get this information from? We were saying our blog said, we really want to create a map, but we were a fan group. We don't know how to create a map. So we didn't know how to go about that, but we knew Inverness fans, we knew Outlander fans coming to Inverness needed an Outlander map. So we got together and we, with the help of Jerry Reynolds, we created the, an Inverness Outlander map. Yeah, it's fantastic because those are the kind of things when you're you're coming to Inverness and the, the wider highlands, the history is just incredible. Right? It is, Isn't it, it is. Outlander is a great way to get you started on that journey. It is, yes, no, um, we created the Outlander map and then along with that we then created the, an audio map. So our map, it is each section on it because you can only have a small little section on the map to explain with a little bit of explanation. So we then had an audio map that goes along with the map, which tells you a lot more information about each place. And it's free, it's free, because we're uh, we're fans of Outlander, helping other fans of Outlander. That's what our plan was all along. Now, in case you're wondering what that ghostly sound was behind Sinead, we are in the basement of McGregor's Bar, and the basement is quite close to the men's toilets. And that is the hand dryer when you hear that going off in the background. It's not, uh, it's not anything else. Uh, so that, just in case you're wondering what those sound effects are, uh, we haven't really worked on that. Thank you very much for getting in touch. And uh, uh, Anne Stillman from South Lanarkshire, Susan Hurst from Oklahoma, uh, Kara, Karim, Karian McDonald from Canada, and uh, Annabelle Berkeris in South Lincolnshire, and Lynette Rawlinson in Florence in Oregon. That's absolutely brilliant all over the place watching. And I've got to do a shout out to, to stop a jealousy forming in a partner. I have to say hello to John Gary Steele, the set designer of Outlander. Um, he's very jealous that Barry got a shout out first. Do they, do they want Sorry. any job getting this sorted out? I mean, this is, <laughs> this is the best we had actually, I think. If you actually saw the other, well, you saw where Sinead was being interviewed and you saw the the twisted Christmas tree. I mean, that was... She's still there. <laughs> to be fair, that was me. I put that up. This has been done by you guys. It's looking a, a little bit better, isn't it, altogether? Uh, so, yes, the Outlander map. I'm very eager to show everybody the Outlander map. This is it here. Um, it features 29 locations in and around Inverness. We have on one side, you could do a walking tour of Inverness. And if you have transport or you wish to have a tour guide, there are other locations in and around Inverness itself. Now we hope eventually to feature most of these locations on mm -hmm. our shows in the coming months. Um, but last year we actually teamed up with GeoTourist uh, to produce an audio app. So every location on the map syncs up with an audio section on the app. Now if you were wanting to get a copy of the map, you would actually have to come over to Scotland to get that. They are really only available in and around Inverness at the Tourist Information Centre, hotels, guest houses, bed and breakfasts. But you can actually download it from our blog 
invernessoutlanders.wordpress.com. Um, and if you wanted to listen to the audio app, just uh, download a GeoTourist app and you can listen to that anywhere in the world. Yeah, that's a brilliant, I, I really take my hat off to you guys doing yeah. that. It's really absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of thing, as I say, you would expect perhaps a bigger organisation like Visit Scotland to take control of. But thankfully they haven't. It's <laughs> probably better that it's left to you guys to do this. So, you were going to... No, I, was, I was just going to say, I mean, the fact that we have, um, without any funding, and mm -hmm. just our group, produced a map and an audio app, makes me feel very proud. Um, because we're just a small group, there's only 27 members at the moment, but we come from all walks of life, and when we all get together in our, our monthly sessions, we just all bring such a lot to the table, lots of good creative ideas and knowledge. We've got people that work for our National Health Service, police force, our teachers, uh, reenactors, tour guides. We've got an author and historian in our group. We've even got people who run their own businesses. We have um, a gin distiller. Mm -hmm. I think you've got There's a, a wee bottle of it yep. uh, somewhere at Loch Ness. Gin. Loch Ness Gin. Thank you to uh, Laurie and Karen and her husband on the banks of Loch Ness for producing that. Um, we have on the other side of Loch Ness, Marge Tate, who runs Highland Celtic Art. Uh, she does some fabulous items like scarves, both with Outlander and Scotland um, emblems on them. And she does ceramics and uh, many other things. She's got a great uh, studio just on the banks of Loch Ness. And you'll also see behind me a scarf. Well, we have, uh, as one of our members, Claire Campbell, who runs uh, the Prickly Thistle Weaving Mill, uh, which only started up very recently. And if that name is familiar to some of you, she actually worked together with Sam Hewan to produce the Sassanach Tartan Collection that he recently launched. Yeah, we'll have to get her and she's great crack. She's she is, good, yeah. good chat all together. Well, we are going to go back to Clava Cairns just now. This is John Orr, who's a countryside ranger with High Life Highland, and he's looking at the history of the Cairns and their association with the winter solstice. So there's three three Cairns here at Clava. There's the two chamber Cairns, and then there's this, uh, this um, ring Cairn, which doesn't have a passageway. So there's different kinds of kinds of structure here with different purposes. Um, and what's unusual about Clapa Cairns is actually, as well as having the burial cairns, you've got the you've got the stone circles around them, which is quite an unusual feature. So what from archaeological evidence, what they found in the centre of this middle cairn was quite a lot of small pieces of bone and bits of charcoal. So it might suggest that there was burning here and there was some kind of processing of the of the dead here. And it would probably have been somebody of great significance to the, to the local people, to the local clan, or to the local group. It's a bit like having a state funeral for somebody of importance, like uh, maybe Dyer, Winston Churchill, or somebody. So there's a, there's a lot of ceremony, there's a lot of parading and uh, rituals happening at, on the site. So if you can imagine somebody, say like a chief of the tribe has died that year, what would have happened? One theory is that they might have had these excarnation platforms in or, in or around the cairn. And you can see in this illustration, this is more of a, a, an Iron Age looking lot here. But anyway, you get the general idea. But there was a raised platform on on wooden uh, poles. And the person that was, was laid out, and they were left to the elements uh, and picked out by crows and buzzards and, and eagles and things. And one of the reasons for this raised platform was to keep things like bears and wolves from dragging the body away. So it was, it was quite a common practice in and around the world, in different parts of the world actually, this excarnation. Eventually, maybe over the, this, over the year, the, the corpse would just become a pile of bones. And with the evidence of charcoal in this, in this uh, ring here, and it's possible that the bones were then burnt. And uh, what was found was just small pieces of bone. So this could be part of a ceremony. Um, and from this cairn, you might have paraded to uh, the next part of the ceremony, which could have been at midwinter, or it could have been straight after the burning of the body. Absolutely fascinating stuff there from John Orr. Thank you very much for that, John. It was yourself out seeing him. Yes, I was the video. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, we've got uh, more people getting involved in videoing because some of the Inverness Outlanders team and uh, Sinead, I mm -hmm. think, were out there at the solstice. Uh, not yesterday, it has to be said, but uh, just have a look at this. It really is quite magical. Absolutely. Yeah. So so fortunate to be there. Now, we are really, really lucky to have in amongst uh, the people who are going to be involved in this programme, Hamish MacDonald. Uh, he is a writer uh, of poetry, uh, playwright, uh, songs, very good comic songs, actually, very, very good. I've also worked with him on a couple of BBC productions, um, the Captain Simon Fraser, the story of his life, and uh, one about uh, James Scott Skinner, the Strath speaking. Uh, great, great guy. Um, and he's also uh, been involved, in, he's the first Scots Scriever, uh, which was a, a writer's residency set up by the Scottish Government in association with the National Library of Scotland to help promote the understanding of the Scots language. So that was just a few years ago, so that kind of shows you the standing. He was also the first writer in residence at uh, Robert Burns' fellowship for Dumfries and Galloway. And uh, we're so lucky to have him on board with us. This is a, a piece of work, as I say, he's a, a poet and writer. This is a piece of work inspired by the solstice and clavicairns. I come here at midwinter to stand in the shadows of those who built these cairns. Fire, time, mortality. Temple of light, calendar and stone, a monument to the dead. I look into this passage and ask who they were. Sowers of crops, tenders of beasts, workers of metal, watchers of the seasons, and ask what connects us across 4,000 solstice sunsets, 4,000 journeys around the sun. I come here at midwinter to wear the skins of the people who raised these boulders, looking out southwest to the sun's lowest depression, knowing that each day beyond this it must climb again in gradual ascent to the north. As through these stones we stand on the threshold of another year, for here is where old years die, new ones begin. Here is a graveyard of past years, here is the nativity of those yet to come. Ages before Ptolemy and Copernicus, or Galileo put his eye to a glass to point at the night sky. Long before the tyranny of calendars and clocks divided existence into months, weeks, days, hours, seconds, there was only this. And how, forth of this point, from these stones, the sun would rise again from its lowest ebb, the world be reborn in leaves and birdsong with crops to be sown, plans to be laid, journeys imagined, resolutions made. I come here at midwinter and feel the weight of 500,000 winter days, one continuous dark season and primal fears which can gnaw at the soul to isolate us from the world. And think how they too, at this time, must have drawn closer to the fire, the light, the body of the kirk, drawing strength from story and song as I place another stick on this fire to forge new hope in the flames and see past times dance in raised glasses, in kisses and handshakes, in lumps of coal and new brooms, in first foots and tall dark visitors, in jigs and reels and newly broken bottle seals, in ringing bells and spreads of fine food, in ships' horns and fireworks, in dancing bairns and spinning bottles, in riotous songs and poems read and daft things said in ginger wines and old lang signs of old years gone and new begun let this fire light the way we made it one more time around the sun Well, that was quite moving. I, that's the first time I've actually heard that and it exceeded my expectations because 
just to, to, to put, put you in the picture, Hamish actually wrote that for tonight's programme. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. quite incredible. Um, we have, we've asked him to do so many things that, you know, for other programmes that we've been involved in, and it always comes up trumps. Yeah. Um, so he's a, an amazing guy altogether. Also, if you can have a look at his website, you'll find another couple of books. He's actually done a, a, a book of poetry about a football club. Uh, for Clyde Bank, he's been taken on by Clyde Bank as their poet, mm -hmm. which is very forward thinking for a football yeah. club. But this uh, this is a beautiful book, Wilson's Ornithology of Birds in Scots. And it's poems in Scots that uh, Hamish has done alongside the illustrations of Alexander Wilson, who is a paisley weaver and radical who went over. He was actually the founding father of American ornithology. And so it's a nine volume book. So Hamish has taken this and the the drawings in it are absolutely stunning, and uh, so is the, the poetry. So it's uh, absolutely great. So please check out Hamish's work. So we've got more Outlander news uh, coming up and some little snippets of information about what's happening in Inverness. We do. This means we're actually coming towards the close of the, of the programme because <laughs> we will always, towards the end of the close of the programme, have Outlander news where appropriate and some news about Inverness as well. Now, ideally, we'd like to be able to bring you some news about the new or the next Outlander TV series, or perhaps the ninth book in the series, or perhaps the launch of Men in Kilts, but we can do none of that, unfortunately. But what I can do is say, for those of you unable to visit Scotland this year, that Culloden Battlefield Visitor Centre are working hard on a 360-degree tour of the battlefield, and that will feature Katrina McIntosh, who was the guide that took um, Sam and Graham around the battlefield for many kilts this year. And so we hope to have more information about that next month, so watch this space. I know, were you going to say something? No, no, I was listening. It's <laughs> <laughs> a very intent look. Um, and just for information tomorrow, the 23rd, Katrina Balf is actually joining Josh Horowitz. Josh, I'll get my teeth around this one, Josh Horowitz. Uh, for a special holiday episode of the Happy, Sad, Confused podcast. Now, it's a live podcast. Uh, you need to buy a ticket. Um, there are taped appearances by Sam and Graham. Starts at 3pm Eastern Time and 8pm GMT. Great, great. Well, I was kind of tasked with finding out the Inverness news, and I looked all over, and all I could find out is that we're shutting. We are, <laughs> we, we are closing on Boxing Day. It's all going... Quiet again. We've been really lucky up here in Inverness. We've been tier one. Uh, for those of you who are living abroad, that basically means we were allowed to live fairly normally. Uh, we had very few cases of the dreaded COVID, uh, but things have got a bit more serious just now. So we're locking down, which, you know, I don't mind hunkering down for January anyway. It's an absolutely awful month. So no big problem and uh, more time to research and read and do learn some more tunes. But I also did learn, whilst I was looking for things, I happened to stumble upon the Inverness Courier, and BBC, uh, BBC Alba have got a programme called Cinema Gadakelica, I think it's called, and it's basically looking at all the sites in Scotland that films have been shot in. So you've got James Bond from Russia with Love, uh, and it goes to Argyle uh, for there. And then that bit of Argyle was meant to represent Turkey which is quite incredible. It must have been a very cheap budget, I would have thought, to <laughs> not be able to do that. And then they obviously go to Glencoe, where James Bond was supposedly born, and that was um, in uh, Skyfall. Uh, now, this one was completely new to me. Uh, Lochanari on Harris uh, was used on the film 2001, A Space Odyssey. Stanley Kubrick used it. He did some filters mm -hmm. and things on it, but used that as the surface of the moon. So I've always thought when I go through Harris, it's like, wow, it's an otherworldly feel to it altogether. And Gene Kelly, this one cracked me up actually. Gene Kelly came over to Scotland to see if it would be perfect to do Brigadoon. And he was most disappointed because it was raining the whole time he was here. <laughs> so he thought, we'll just do it in Hollywood. And they built the set for it. So that's a programme that's on BBC Alba. Um, and I think that'll be available to most of you in the UK. I'm not sure what the, the story is of getting it abroad. But uh, it sounds like it's going to be a really good programme. Yes, and um, my uh, final story about Inverness News is that last year, uh, a 1,200-year-old Pictish stone was unearthed, um, deep, buried deep under vegetation. Now, just uh, by way of setting the scene, the Picts are the peoples that lived in the north of Scotland from about 3 to 10 AD. 
I quite like the sound of the Picts. They sound like they were quite fierce warriors. They actually protected Scotland from the Romans. The Romans didn't make it up this far north. In fact, the Romans called the Picts the painted people, and we assume that they meant that they were tattooed. And apparently, the Picts would go into battle without any clothes on, with only their tattoos to cover up their modesty. Brilliant. Now, <laughs> yes. imagine that's going to frighten anybody. <laughs> well, yeah, but on the other hand, can you think of any peoples that ever lived in Scotland ever who could go about naked? Maybe they weren't painted blue. Maybe they were just <laughs> freezing. Blue. That, was a, that was maybe the problem. Yeah, the Picts. But those are the pits. So they didn't really leave us much information about themselves. But what they did leave were these big stones uh, with inscribed stories, mainly about their battles, their successful battles. And some of the stones would have a cross inscribed on them. And this is what was found at Dingwall, just outside of Inverness. It's called a cross slab. And they're very rare. There's only about 50 of them uh, known in the country. And so, therefore, it is of national importance. It actually went on display in the Dingwall Museum just last week. And it's in the window. And because Dingwall Museum is closed because of COVID restrictions, um, you can actually walk past the window on the high street and view mm -hmm. the stone. And there's somebody from the museum to tell you all about it. That's great. Yeah. Again, I was really lucky when I was brought up just outside of Inverness. We, uh, the farmer's field beside us was dug up and they found the boar stone. Um, which is now in front of the, the townhouse. And that's a, a, a carving of a, a complete boar that was done by the Picts. And uh, the boar was celebrated by them. And, and it basically showed that you had plenty of... Um, you were one of the heads of state mm -hmm. if you had a boar uh, on your stone. So, yeah, again, we just grew up with it and didn't really think too much about it. But that is just about it. Um, thank you so much for getting in touch with us, all of those of you who did. Remember, please share the programme with those that you think might be interested. Please send us your ideas in as well. It's uh, hello the house at yahoo.com. Uh, if you can send anything in there, uh, we're going to do another program in January. Uh, January is traditionally where we look to Robert Burns mm -hmm. really for influence. Um, we have a we have Burns nights for we eat haggis for about three weeks. I think it certainly feels like that. I've been, I've been a few of them. Eat haggis and drink whiskey and uh, recite very long poems. Uh, so that's it. But what we're going to look at is the fact that Robert Burns actually came to the Highlands and to Inverness. He was collecting a lot of his melodies for some of his most famous songs actually came from Gaelic songs. He was also a fiddle player. So I'll hopefully be finding out uh, a little bit more about his fiddling style. So we're looking for the guests for that program. Got a couple of them up our sleeve. Um, but that's what we're going to be looking at mostly, I think. And then We're also going to be meeting another Inverness Outlander. Now that's put, put the wind up all of them because they've no idea who I'm talking about at this point in time. And we'll be speaking to other experts about um, connections with Outlander and Inverness. And just before you pick, I know you've picked your fiddle up, but just before you actually play it, I just wanted to say that um, if anybody watching is interested in any of the people that we've featured tonight, or any of the, the, the places that we've talked about, we have a blog and information sheet that details all the contacts and how you can follow them or get in touch with them. Um, if you, you can download that at our blog, invernessoutlanders.wordpress.com. Great, great. So I'm going to leave you with one more tune from uh, this trusty old tomb, 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 uh, <laughs> the airs and melodies peculiar to the Highlands and Isles of Scotland, chiefly acquired during the interesting period between 1715 and 1745. This is called the Highland Bumpkin, or the favourite dram, and uh, it was actually a song that was sung by the Jacobites after 1715 had failed. And uh, it was all in praise of uh, King James, but it was all kind of in code. So, uh, and again, Captain Simon Fraser took all the lyrics out. So we're just getting it from other people that we've, we find out the story. So this is it. So thank you very much for joining us and uh, we'll raise a dram to you. <laughs>